for patients to be eligible for bevacizumab, you have to be confident about their histology. It's a non-squamous drug. Um, um, you also have to be uh, uh, aware of the you know, presence of hemoptysis, which is a contraindication. You know, one of the difficulties in clinical practice is how much hemoptysis is too much. And you know, we, we use a very rough guideline, more than half a teaspoon. It's very difficult to quantitate in this setting. So I think physicians have different levels of tolerance of how much by history the, the homoptysis may or be. I think age is an issue. I think performance status is an issue. Uh, bevacizumab has been largely studied in ECOG PS0 to 1 patients. Um, there is some data in PS2, but I tend not to use it in PS2 um, until we have more data. Uh, Age is an issue. Age is an issue relative to two issues. One is being confident that it's an efficacious drug, um, and then the safety. And, and from the analyses that we have of patients over the age of 70 or 75, um, it's not clear uh, the survival benefit, and it's clear that most of the adverse events or the rate of adverse events is certainly higher in the uh, older age groups. So, you know, I think twice about uh, over the age of 70. I think three times about over the age of 75. And uh, because you can get into some toxicity issues in the older population. That may be relative to the fact that older patients have more comorbidities. And certainly in patients who have uncontrolled hypertension or recent stroke or history of ar particular arterial thrombotic disease, that uh, those certainly are more common the older you are, and that may be the issue around bevacizumab. But certainly, it, 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 it age is a, is a clear issue in my mind with, with regard to the use of this drug. One of the interesting observations about bevacizumab lately is not in the wild-type population. It really is, was uh, in EGFR mutation positive disease. And, we saw at ASCO last year a trial from Japan in known EGFR mutants, um, a randomization between erlotinib versus the combination of erlotinib and bevacizumab. Um, there was a strikingly positive effect of adding bevacizumab. One of the striking things about the PFS curves was that there was immediate separation. Um, pretty impressive, and, and it's, it's, it was quite striking in, in, in my mind. Um, and the uh, median progression-free survival on the erlotinib arm, if I remember, was in the nine to 10 month range, and on the combination arm was in the 16 plus month range. And so this is a, that's a significant difference in, in doing that. Now, it was a small study. We don't have survival data from it yet. Um, it was impressive with regard to PFS. It does change the level of intervention in EGFR mutants. You know, now we treat them with oral therapy. We tend to see them less because they're getting oral therapy. To add bevacizumab requires an every three week IV infusion. There were no new toxicity issues with regard uh, to Bev in that, in that particular trial. But you know, should one relatively small trial uh, set a standard, and I think most of us think that these results are incredibly intriguing. Uh, however, should not establish a standard in the EGFR mutant disease that we need more data. There is an ongoing trial in the U.S. Uh, called the ACRU trial. Um, it's being led by Tom Stinchcomb and Passiani, uh, in which it is of the same design. And, and, and I'm, I actually think the plan is is once this trial is done to combine the U.S. data with the Cato data and kind of give it more power, much like Lux Lung 3 and Lux Lung 6 were, were combined. So stay tuned. Um, maybe it's a better treatment. Um, it's going to be hard to know how to interpret that because one of the other exciting things in EGFR mutant disease is the kind of new generation of third generation EGFR TKIs. And so that's um, you know, it's a great level of excitement around those drugs at this particular time.